The Marvel Cinematic Universe is certainly a tangled web of events. A lot of stuff happens at various different times, but each movie's history tends to feel isolated. A lot of stuff happens in the past, which is only alluded to in certain movies. But I will try my best to bring all of these together into a single timeline. If I miss something, please don't kill me. I'm just an average enjoyer who wishes to try his hand at making a timeline for those who don't know the chronology of the series. Hopefully this will get you ready for the next installments into the MCU, so let's get into it. Eternity in the Past The Celestials begin to exist. They are led by the Celestial Arisham the Judge. 13.7 billion years in the past. The universe starts. Malekith and the Dark Elves are living their best lives in the darkness, and the six Infinity Stones come into existence. Arisham decides to rain on the Dark Elves parade by making the first star. A cycle begins in which planets are seeded with baby Celestials. The Deviants are created by Arisham to protect the life forms of a seeded planet from predators, but then he needs to make the Eternals to protect life on planets from the Deviants because the Deviants decide they don't want to be tools of Arisham and want to live too. The Eternals begin to aid with the emergences and bringing about new Celestials. This continues until their consciences catch up with them on Earth. Millions of years BC. The Celestial known as Ego is formed. He begins to search for more life in the universe and is slowly disappointed in what he finds. Using a human vessel, he begins to conceive children across the universe in hopes that he will conceive one that possesses celestial DNA. However, only one child is born with it, Peter Quill. He sends the Ravagers, led by Yandu Udanta, to deliver them, all to serve as a battery for the expansion, in which Ego attempts to make everything in the universe Ego. Ancient Times the demon Chathan creates the Darkhold after seeing a vision of the future in which the Scarlet Witch rules upon a throne in Mount Wundagore. 7984 BC Various tribes bordering what would later be known as Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, and Southern Sudan war with each other. This war is only ended when a man named Bashenga appears on the scene and takes up the title of the first Black Panther and unites the warring tribes into what would later be known as Wakanda. 5,000 years ago. The Kree begin to conquer and go about creating super soldiers. To do this, they come to Earth and begin creating beings known as Inhumans. These Inhumans eventually form a society and move to the moon, where they are ruled by Black Bolt. Another Inhuman, though, is created named Alvius, but is later named Hive. Hive would form a fanatical following out of highly influential people. These people would eventually form the organization that would end up as part of the Nazi war machine known as Hydra. It was also at this time frame that the last recorded convergence occurred, in which all nine realms aligned. During this time, Malekith and the Dark Elves reclaimed the Aether, aka the Reality Stone, in hopes of returning the universe to complete darkness. From this point, King Bor led the Asgardian army against them and managed to defeat the Dark Elves and seize the Aether, where he hid it away from the world. Thousands of years in the past. Agamotto discovers the multiverse, and in doing so, he finds the Dark Dimension and Dormammu. To combat this, Agamotto would learn to channel energy from the multiverse to create mystic energy. He would then train others to do so and would form the Masters of the Mystic Arts, serving as their first Sorcerer Supreme. At some point, the Masters of the Mystic Arts find the Time Stone and name it the Eye of Agamotto. It is also in this slightly vague time frame that King Bor would die in battle. His son, Odin, would rise to the throne and give birth to his first child, Hela, goddess of death. Together, they would take Asgard from being keepers of the peace to conquerors, leading to a conflict that would end with the subjugation of the Nine Realms. This was to form something known as the Asgardian Empire. However, while Odin was content with only taking over the realms of Yggdrasil, his daughter Hela was not. She planned for a grander and bloodier conflict, and Odin realized the danger posed by teaching her his warring ways and took the easy way out by sealing her up in hell for thousands of years. 965 AD The Frost Giants made their way into Midgard, or as you know it, Earth, around the area of Tonsberg, Norway. They plan to lay waste to the planet with the Casket of Ancient Winters, but Odin leads the Asgardian army against them and defeats the Frost Giants, causing their leader, Lofi, to surrender. Odin loses an eye in this battle, but he finds a bouncing baby icicle that would later become known as Loki. 1000s AD Shu Wenwu, a man later known as the Mandarin, discovers a set of ten rings that increase his power and offer various abilities such as immortality. 
he would begin conquering the world and setting up an army, and later a terrorist organization known as the Ten Rings. He would eventually become obsessed with finding Tola, and would instead find a girl empowered by Tola's great defender, Ying Li. They eventually fall in love. However, the citizens of Tola refuse to accept Shu Wen Wu, and so Ying Li gives up the powers given to her by the great defender and would leave to be with Shu Wen Wu, where she would give birth to two children, Shang Qi and Xia Ling. Ying Li is then killed by like the Yakuza or something and restarts Shu Wen Wu's desire for revenge, which causes him to take up his rings again and turn his son into an assassin. Of course, Shu Wen Wu's love life and the things thereafter happen in the late 20th century, but I added it here so I don't accidentally forget later. 1100s AD an Asgardian berserker who adopted the name Elliot Randolph was sent on a mission to Earth. While there, he fell in love with its people and he decided to stay. He would break his staff into many parts and hide them across the world to stop the use of this weapon and its dark magic ability to conjure up all of your previous trauma to increase your strength through rage. 1316, the Ancient One is born. 1546 AD. Elliot Randolph falls in love with a French girl who he proceeds to tell his life story to. This French girl in turn tells a priest who writes it down, forming the legend of the warrior that stayed. 1519 AD, the Eternals eradicate all the deviants on Earth, or so they think. 1693 AD, the Salem witch trials are going on and Agatha Harkness is put on trial by her coven for stealing the Darkhold to study dark magic. She denied the allegations, but when her mother confirmed it and began the process of execution, it proved that Agatha, all along, had the power to defend herself, and stripped the coven of their magic and escaped. 1853 AD After hearing about a group of lords who traveled across the stars, Randolph visited a castle in Gloucestershire, England to investigate while attending a costume ball. He was told by a drunken man wearing an owl costume that there was no space travel, but only ritualistic killings. Randolph was pleased with this answer and proceeded to enjoy the party, but he did not realize that this was false as they had been using the monolith to reach Hive on another planet to provide him with new vessels. 1931 AD Johann Schmidt, a member of the organization that would become known as Hydra, joins the Third Reich. He attempts to join the Sturmabteilung, but is rejected and instead joins the Schutzstaffel. At this time, Abraham Erskine is working on the Super Soldier Serum. Around this time, Johann Schmidt hears of it and how he will make the superior man. He decides that he must be that superior man, and so he forces Erskine to administer the serum to him, but an unexpected side effect occurs which results in Johann's face melting off. If you didn't know, which you really should, Johann Schmidt is the Red Skull. 1942 AD Nazi forces invade Norway, and Hydra focuses on a stone church in Tonsberg. Breaking through, he begins questioning the Keeper about the Jewel of Odin's treasure room. When he gets nowhere, he begins to search the stone carving of Yggdrasil. He finds at the base of the tree the hidden image of Nidhogg and presses its eye to reveal a secret compartment that houses the Tesseract, which is in truth the Infinity Stone known as the Space Stone. He begins to form new technology with it and even kills Ernest Kaufman and absorbs his division into Hydra, forming new weapons for the Nazis. Aisha, Najma, Salim, and Fariha also run from the British army during partition and Aisha finds a mysterious bangle. She ends up fleeing to a village where she meets a man named Hassan and the two have a daughter named Sana Ali together. As partition grows worse, she convinces her family to leave Pakistan. Aisha witnesses Najma and Ali gets away from Hassan. Aisha isn't heard from again. 1943 to 1945 AD the first Stark Expo takes place and Stephen Rogers is refused from service once again due to his frailty. However, he is approached by Abraham Erskine who approves him under the intention of using him for a top secret military project named Project Rebirth, in which Erskine plans to roll out the perfected super soldier serum. Rogers proceeds to join basic training where he is less than impressive. However, the time comes to try the experiment. He is escorted by SSR Special Agent Peggy Carter. Hidden in a secret lab behind a storefront, Steve is taken to the deeper levels where he meets Howard Stark for the first time. He is injected in all his major muscle groups with the serum and is saturated with Vita rays, which stabilizes the growth. However, a Hydra agent causes an explosion, kills Erskine, and attempts to escape with the serum. He is intercepted by the newly empowered Steve Rogers and then takes a cyanide capsule, hailing Hydra with his last breath. After this, Steve spends most of his time both being studied by the military and being used to sell war bonds. However, he craved to serve his country in a more hands-on method. 
Steve would later be entertaining the soldiers of what remained of the 107th Infantry Regiment as part of the USO, but learns that his best friend, James Buchanan, Bucky Barnes, has been captured by the Nazis. And so with the help of Howard Stark and Peggy Carter, he infiltrates behind enemy lines to rescue them, and in doing so, meets Johann Schmidt for the first time and helps eradicate a factory and gain intelligence on other factory locations using his photographic memory. Returning to base, he surrenders himself for disciplinary action, but is forgiven due to the great deed he had done. He shares his information and is allowed to take action. Given the official rank of captain, the newly christened Captain America leads his specially selected group of soldiers, the Howling Commandos, into enemy lines. But this doesn't go very well for Bucky. Bucky falls out of a moving train into the tundra below, where he is captured by Arnim Zola and Hydra, and is subjected to the Nazi variation of Project Rebirth, creating the Winter Soldier. Steve finally finds the hidden base of Hydra and launches a full-scale assault on it, with the rest of the American forces where he attempts to stop Johann Schmidt from using the Tesseract to decimate major American cities. After a battle, Johann Schmidt is teleported away by the Tesseract, and Steve finds that the only way to stop the attack is by plowing the plane into the tundra below. There he rests in suspended animation for years. 1946 AD the events of the Peggy Carter series occurs in which Peggy continues to work for the SSR despite the sexism of the time and goes on various secret missions to stop Leviathan as well as Emma Frost from getting their hands on weapons of mass destruction. Not too much longer after this, Peggy Carter would join Howard Stark in forming S.H.I.E.L.D., becoming the organization's first director. At some point in time, she would reunite with Steve, who had traveled back in time to spend his life with her. 1948 AD Peggy's dream come true. Her man is so loyal that he literally travels back through time just to have that last dance with Peggy. And probably do some other stuff. The guy is a 105 year old virgin. I think he's waited long enough. I mean, I guess he is. Unless what Banner said in She-Hulk. Steve Rogers is not a virgin. He lost his virginity to a girl in 1943 on the USO tour. 1960s through 1990s AD. Carol Danvers is born and ends up joining the Air Force, where she is placed on Project Pegasus with a Wendy Lawson who was secretly a Cree scientist known as Marvell. However, Marvell was killed when the project failed, and Danvers was exposed to Tesseract energy wiping her memory. She restarted her life as part of the Cree military, working with Jan Rog, the Cree soldier, who was sent to kill Marvell. Eventually, Danvers attempts to remember who she was and uncovers the truth of her past as well as the truth of the Skrull forces who live on Earth in secret. She ends up meeting Phil Coulson, Nicholas Fury, and S.H.I.E.L.D. It's during this time that Fury loses his eye to an alien that had taken the form of a cat. It is also in 1988 that Peter Quill loses his mother and is then abducted by Yandu Udanta, who upon learning what Ego is doing to the children he is delivering, refuses to deliver Quill to him and instead makes the boy a Ravager. In the 70s and 80s, Hank Pym works with S.H.I.E.L.D. on various missions alongside his wife as the duo known as Ant-Man and the Wasp. In 1989, Hank Pym quits S.H.I.E.L.D. It's also during the 90s that Howard Stark is assassinated by the Winter Soldier as per Hydra's orders. In the 1970s, Tony Stark comes back in time to take the Tesseract from Camp Lahai. Captain America would later come back to return it. They also steal some Pym particles. Shh, don't tell anyone. 2000 AD. Tony Stark is at a New Year's Eve party celebrating the turn of the century. Okay, so technically this event starts in 1999 and continues into 2000, pardon me. While at this party, Tony Stark meets Maya Henson, who he proceeds to have an affair with, and the disabled scientist Aldrich Killian, both of which are working on a project for a secret serum known as Extremis. He says he'll meet Killian on the roof, but blows him off. However, he continues to work with Maya Henson and helps solve the issue preventing them from beginning human experimentation. 2010 AD. Tony Stark visits Kunar, Afghanistan to showcase his newly created Jericho missile, when his caravan is ambushed by the terrorist organization known as the Ten Rings. Tony is attacked with his own weapons, which results in various shrapnel being lodged in his body. He's taken to a cave where his life is saved by Dr. Yinsen, who installs an electromagnet into Tony's chest. Tony quickly replaces this with a miniature arc reactor. He is then approached by Raza, the leader of the operation, who demands that Stark build him the Jericho missile. However, Tony takes this time to build a weaponized suit. He activates the suit and proceeds to escape, carving a path for Yinsen. However, Yinsen is fatally wounded. Stark then single-handedly eradicates the entire encampment before escaping with the rockets in his suit's feet. 
This, however, leads to the suit's destruction and abandonment in the desert. Stark is rescued and taken home by the military, where he has a sudden change of heart after seeing the effects of the weapons his company has created. He announces that Stark Industries will stop making weapons, and Obadiah Stane quickly walks back the remarks. At his home workshop, Stark spends months working on a newer version of the suit he used to escape the Ten Rings facility. Tony then gets informed that various Stark Industries weapons were delivered to the Ten Rings, including the Jericho missile, and that these weapons are being used to attack Golmira, Yinsen's home village. Tony then dons his armor and sets out to right his wrong. This is the debut of the armored hero, Iron Man. He attempts to use Pepper to prove that Obadiah Stane has been selling weapons to terrorists, but not only does she find that, she finds that Stane has been building his own weaponized armored suit, the Warmonger. She contacts Phil Coulson of S.H.I.E.L.D., and they attempt to apprehend Stane, but instead they initiate an attack. Stark would go out to fight the Warmonger and would take advantage of the ice issue that occurs at high altitudes and use it to send the Warmonger crashing down. The battle eventually ends when Stark instructs Pepper Potts to overload the arc reactor and fry everything on the roof, including himself. He miraculously survives, but Stane isn't so lucky. In the end, S.H.I.E.L.D. asks Stark to read a prepared statement, but he forgoes this in favor of just saying, I am Iron Man. Cue the Black Sabbath song as the credits roll. 2011 AD. Dealing with the news that Tony Stark is Iron Man, this information makes its way to Russia where Anton Vanko, a former worker at Stark Industries, watches this as he nears his death. His son Ivan Vanko appears upon being called to care for him, but witnesses his death which harshly affects him. He blames his father's death on the Stark family who had them sent back to Russia after Anton Vanko was accused of selling weapons on the black market. He begins to form his own weapons using the blueprints to the arc reactor. Meanwhile, Tony Stark is enjoying the newly recreated Stark Expo. He is then given a summons, called before a congressional hearing due to his new weapon, the Iron Man armor. There, Justin Hammer, the CEO of Hammer Industries, proceeds to make a case of why the armor is dangerous and should be turned over to the military, by showing various images of other countries creating similar weapons. Tony, however, uses his hacking prowess to display videos, proving that these countries have had all of their weapons fail and further shows a video of Justin Hammer testing a suit. The suit mortally wounds its user, but Hammer states that the pilot survives. Due to this, Tony manages to walk free and Justin Hammer's contractor license is suspended for a while. As time continues to pass, Stark becomes painfully aware that his arc reactor is killing him, and he becomes self-destructive. This leads to him racing in Monaco where he encounters Ivan Vanko. This sends ripples through the congressional hearings as it proves the tech is out there. Stark holds a party for his birthday and gets drunk and begins to use his suit as a party trick. This leads to a fight with his best friend, Colonel James Rhodes. Rhodes takes a suit and uses it to beat Tony's ass and escapes with it. Hammer then outfits the suit with more weapons, forming the armor known as War Machine. Through the use of the newly sprung Ivan Vanko, Hammer forms drones which he displays at Stark Expo. However, Vanko takes remote control of this and uses it to attack Tony Stark, who had just then managed to fix the problem with his arc reactor. Together with War Machine, Iron Man puts the threat to bed, kills Vanko, and sends Hammer to prison. Iron Man is then officially recruited by S.H.I.E.L.D. as an Avenger, with Stark himself serving as liaison. After this, the events of the Incredible Hulk take place. Bruce Banner, attempting to recreate the Super Soldier Serum, ends up transforming himself into a raging monster known as the Hulk. He goes on the run, being chased by the U.S. military. British Special Ops agent Emil Blonsky is sent to track Banner and faces him twice. Blonsky becomes obsessive and takes in Banner's blood and becomes the monster known as the Abomination. Abomination attacks Harlem in an attempt to lure out Banner, which results in a battle between the two. Blonsky is defeated and captured. After this, Blonsky is taken to a cryo cell in Alaska where he is held. For a while, Ross considered adding Blonsky to the Avengers due to him being a decorated war hero. However, Phil Coulson, Jasper Sitwell, and Tony Stark disagreed with it due to his unpredictable nature and Bruce Banner was considered for the position instead. One month after the events of the movie, Stark makes contact with Banner. In the same year, the Asgardian prince, Thor Odinson, is being groomed to become the next king of Asgard, but Loki ruins it by inviting the Frost Giants to the party. Thor is upset, and so he goes to Jotunheim to confront them and nearly starts a war. Due to this, Odin exiles Thor to Midgard. There, he is struck by the van of Jane Foster and hospitalized. He is eventually released and goes on a quest to reclaim his hammer, Mjolnir, which is under S.H.I.E.L.D.'s watch. Clint Hawkeye Barton is ready to kill Thor, but Coulson stops him. Thor fails to pull the hammer and turns depressed. 
He accepts his place on Earth and slowly becomes happy. However, at the time, Odin has fallen into the Odin sleep, and so Loki invites Lothian to kill him, but betrays Lothian in an effort to make himself look heroic and take the throne for himself. He also sends the Destroyer armor to ensure Thor never comes home. But Thor suddenly becomes worthy again through humbleness and love, and manages to reclaim his hammer and destroys the Destroyer. He then travels back to Asgard to stop Loki, who plans to use the Bifrost to destroy Jotunheim, but is stopped when Thor destroys the bridge. Loki and Thor are hanging off the bridge when Odin appears to save them. Loki screams out that he did it for his father, but Odin tells him no. Loki then attempts to commit suicide, but instead ends up being found by Thanos. Thor then laments that he can't return to Jane. 2012 AD Steve Rogers is found by S.H.I.E.L.D. in the Arctic. He is recruited to the Avengers. Loki appears at a hidden base to reclaim the Tesseract and initiates a meltdown which is barely escaped by S.H.I.E.L.D.'s staff. They then call in the Avengers, starting with Bruce Banner, who Natasha Romanoff is sent to recruit due to his expertise in gamma radiation, which the Tesseract puts off. Loki ends up in Germany, where he attempts to get more items required to build a portal to allow Thanos Chitauri army to make it to Earth. Loki ends up making an ass of himself in front of everyone, and Captain America likens him to a Hitler he had punched on several occasions. Iron Man also appears and the two battle Loki and capture him. However, he is sprung by Thor. Thor, Captain America, and Iron Man would fight, but in the end, they reach a consensus and the three make their way to the helicarrier. However, Hawkeye and his forces break Loki out and Loki kills Phil Coulson. The Avengers rally and head to New York, where they face off against Loki and his army. However, they manage to destroy the invading army with a nuclear warhead and close the portal. Also, the Avengers secretly come back in time to get the Tesseract at this point in time. However, they fail and lose it to Loki, causing a branch in the timeline which the Time Variance Authority don't really take a liking to. Also, Captain America fights himself, which is all levels of paradoxical. Still cool, though. And we get a nice nod to the Secret Empire comic book when Captain America gets Loki's scepter, aka the Mind Stone, from Rumlow and Sitwell by uttering Hail Hydra. He later returns with the Mind Stone to replace it where it should have been. Shwarma time! Later that year, the events of Iron Man 3 happen. Stark deals with post-traumatic stress from the Battle of New York. He feels like something greater will happen and he will fail the Avengers, being the only one to survive as the end takes place around him. He can't sleep, so he works on his armors. That's when the US airwaves are hijacked by the Ten Rings. A man who claims to be the Mandarin begins to speak, declaring that he will teach America another lesson. Tony begins to investigate this when his valet, Happy Hogan, is mortally wounded. He issues a challenge to the Mandarin, which results in his home being destroyed by a helicopter attack. Tony manages to escape, though. He's in hiding and still investigating. He discovers that Advanced Idea Mechanics, AIM for short, the company owned by Aldrich Killian, is behind the attacks, and that the terrorist attacks are not terrorism, but misfires when people utilizing extremists go too hot and explode. He uses this information and attempts to stop him, but ends up captured. Meanwhile, the President is captured by Killian's forces, who plan to kill him on live television as an attack by the Ten Rings. However, this was merely to get the Vice President in his pocket, who would inherit the Presidency out from under the President. However, Stark shows up with his army of suits and begins to fight. He manages to kill Killian and save the President with the help of Rhodey, who is using the newly christened Iron Patriot armor. Tony then proceeds to use a new surgery to remove the shrapnel from his body and remove the arc reactor as well. 2013 AD It is after the Iron Man movie that most of the first season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. takes place. In the span between 2012 and 2013, Phil Coulson is brought back to life using a Kree corpse with which the blood is used to synthesize a drug that increases regeneration and was used to revive the agent. They spend most of their time hunting the mysterious clairvoyant, not yet knowing the danger they're in. As this happens, the Nine Realms are in a state of war, and Thor is trying to restore peace, all while Loki is brought before Odin for judgment. While all this is going on, Rocket Raccoon and Fat Thor appear to take the ether from Jane Foster, as well as stealing Mjolnir. Captain America later arrives and returns both items to their rightful places. Loki is placed in prison for the rest of his life. Jane Foster eventually comes into contact with the Aether and ends up poisoned by it. She's taken to Asgard to be healed, but they can't do it. The Dark Elves then attack Asgard and kill Queen Frigga. Thor and Jane witness the funeral for the dead Asgardians and then set off on a quest to find the Dark World. In doing so, they manage to cure Jane, but give Malekith exactly what he wants. 
Loki seemingly dies in this battle, but you know, it's not true. Malekith sets up shop in Greenwich, England, the center of the Convergence. And there, he attempts to turn out the lights on a universal scale, but Thor appears and hammers him. The Aether is then delivered to the Collector to protect it, as it is too dangerous to keep two Infinity Stones so close together. After the events of the Convergence, Coulson's team investigates it and encounters Elliot Randolph, and manages to stop a group of pagans from using Asgardian tech to become overly powerful. Coulson then follows the trails in an attempt to find the true clairvoyant, and they suddenly receive an ominous transmission. Out of the darkness and into the light, hail Hydra. This leads us into the events of Captain America the Winter Soldier. Cap is on a mission to save S.H.I.E.L.D. personnel from an oil tanker, which is secretly a launch platform for a secret satellite meant to aid the new Project Insight. However, Nick Fury is nearly assassinated by a legendary soldier known as the Winter Soldier. It is revealed that the Winter Soldier was a weapon used to alter the world's systems, and there was more than one. Hydra had multiple Winter Soldiers created. Fury makes his way to Steve's apartment and delivers a thumb drive that contains all the info he'll need to solve this mystery. Fury then fakes his own death. It's revealed that the Secretary of the World Security Council, Alexander Pierce, was a member of Hydra. It's also revealed that Council Member Gideon Malik was also a Hydra member as well. They plan to use Project Insight to simultaneously assassinate everyone in the world who will oppose their rule. However, with the help of Steve Rogers, Sam Falcon Wilson, and Natasha Romanoff, they manage to not only stop Insight, but bring down S.H.I.E.L.D. and, by extension, most of Hydra. At around the same time, the Guardians of the Galaxy story begins when Peter Quill takes a job meant to be Yondu's and locates an ancient artifact known as the Orb. Of course, Nebula and War Machine show up from the future to take it first. It is returned to Morag later on by Captain America. In this alternate timeline, Thanos also travels to the future after discovering the truth through future Nebula. Anyway, back to original timeline Peter. He heads to Xandar to deliver the object to the broker. But upon learning that Peter stole the object from Ronan the Accuser's forces, he refuses to do business with Peter. On top of that, Thanos, who is Ronan's benefactor, sends his daughter Gamora after Peter to take the orb. Yondu also puts a bounty out on Peter's head, which Rocket Raccoon and Groot take. However, they all cause a disturbance which ends up with them being placed in prison in the kiln. Here, they meet a man with a grudge named Drax the Destroyer, who wishes to kill Gamora but is convinced not to by Star-Lord, who tells him that it is really Ronan he wants. The group set aside their differences to sell off the orb to the Collector. They manage to escape the kiln before Ronan's forces take over the prison. They make it to nowhere where they attempt to sell the orb to the Collector, who explains to them that it is an infinity stone and an object used in the past by many, but only capable of being truly wielded by a celestial or a being of incredible strength. However, Drax forces a message to be sent to Ronan the Accuser. Ronan appears and Drax fails to kill him. This leads to both Star-Lord and Gamora being captured by Ravagers. They prepare to execute them as the captain's gotta teach stuff. However, they wiggle their way out of it and offer to get the orb back to Yondu. And so Yondu spares Peter for the time being and they head to Xandar where they plan to help the Nova Corps stop Ronan from killing them. This leads to a battle between the allied Ravager Nova forces and Ronan's Sakaran forces. They manage to bring Ronan's warship down, but this costs Groot his life. Ronan manages to survive, but is distracted by Star-Lord who challenges him to a dance-off. This gives Rocket enough time to get a cannon up and running. Rocket destroys the hammer with which Ronan is utilizing the Power Stone, and Peter catches it barehanded. For a moment, he witnesses the other side, but is stabilized by sharing the power between all of the Guardians of the Galaxy, along with his celestial DNA. Together, they use the power to destroy Ronan. They are hailed as heroes, double-cross Yondu again, and have the Milano replaced by the Xandarians, who also wipe their criminal records as thanks. The Guardians go on to become bounty hunters, one of their next missions involving protecting the Sovereign's batteries from a monster that attempts to devour them. They succeed, but Rocket steals the batteries. The Sovereigns only catch on later, and they hire Yondu's crew, who have been freshly cut out of the Ravagers by Sylvester Stallone, uh, Stakar Ogord. It isn't long after, though, that Taserface forces a mutiny. However, Yondu escapes and single-handedly eradicates his mutinous crew, escaping on a small vessel. Elsewhere, Peter Quill is contacted by his father, Ego, who invites him to his planet, or body, I guess. They get there, and Ego begins to explain things to him. Gamora doesn't like this, but Peter doesn't accept her feelings and begins to believe it is best to stay with him. That is, until Ego reveals that it was he who had intentionally caused Peter's mother to die. 
This causes Peter to attack Ego. However, Ego decides instead to use Peter as a battery to continue his expansion and bring it to fruition. Peter is saved by his friends though, and they proceed to the planet's core where Rocket places a bomb that destroys Ego's brain and kills him. The entire planet begins to collapse. Yandu sacrifices himself to save Peter, which earns him being buried with full Ravager honors. Well, not buried. Space dusted. I miss Yandu. 2015 AD. The Avengers are now focusing on finishing off Hydra when they end up encountering the Maximoff twins who seek vengeance against Tony Stark for his weapons which killed their parents. However, they back off, and Baron Strucker is captured. The Avengers manage to take Loki's scepter back, and both Bruce and Tony discover that they can use it to finish their AI project, Ultron. They keep attempting to do so with what limited time they have with the scepter, but nothing seems to work. Ultron is created with the sole directive to protect humanity no matter what. Then Jarvis makes the mistake of letting Ultron look at Twitter, and suddenly Ultron believes that humanity should perish instead. Robot James Spader then marches into the living room and declares all of the Avengers as killers, and in an attempt to prove him wrong, they hit him with a hammer. The Avengers aren't very happy with Tony and Bruce, and Ultron ends up recruiting Wanda and Pietro Maximoff to his side, and together they begin to look to head for Africa to search for Vibranium. This leads them to Ulysses Clow, who Ultron accidentally cuts the hand off of. The Avengers attempt to stop him, but Wanda Maximoff hypnotizes Bruce Banner and causes him to hulk out. Iron Man dons his Hulkbuster armor to face Banner, but it hardly works. Only after dropping a skyscraper on him. The Avengers decide to lay low for a while by going to Hawkeye's house. Ultron attempts to use Vibranium and the Mind Stone to create his next iteration, a biological android that he names Vision. However, this is interrupted by the Avengers, who steal Ultron's Vision. However, instead of destroying it, Tony takes it into his own hands to complete it using Jarvis as a template. They fight this, but the vision is completed and awakens. He ends up a new Avenger. Tony isn't always wrong. Ultron heads to the Maximovs' home of Sokovia, where he turns the entire freaking city into a weapon and attempts to end the entire planet. The Avengers manage to stop this, however, and Vision manages to kill Ultron by turning off the Wi-Fi. Relatable. After this comes the Ant-Man movie's events. Scott Lang is a prisoner on parole. He accidentally ends up stealing technology from Hank Pym. He is then recruited by Hank to destroy the Yellow Jacket suit due to how Darren Cross had betrayed him and continued to work on and replicate the Pym Particle. Lang is sent to an old storage house where he hopes to find the Yellow Jacket suit, but to his horror, it is an Avengers compound now. This leads to Lang facing off against Falcon and disabling his suit. He ends up going to Pym Technologies to steal the Yellow Jacket suit, but Darren Cross is using it. The two fight, and it ends up taking them to Scott's daughter's house. The only hope Scott feels that he can defeat Darren is to go subatomic and fit between the armor plating and destroy the regulator. This succeeds and kills Darren, but it results in Scott being lost in the quantum realm. However, Scott manages to escape it, which Hank said should be impossible. 2016 AD In the next movie, Captain America Civil War, or as it should be known, Avengers 2 and a Half Family Issues. In this movie, Captain America is tracking Brock Rumlow, aka Crossbones, a Hydra agent, who is attempting to steal a biological weapon from Nigeria. He ends up trying to commit suicide with a bomb vest, but Wanda Maximoff attempts to stop him by putting him in the air away from people. Sadly, she gets him too close to a building which results in the death of many people, including Wakanda relief workers. This causes the United Nations to think twice about allowing the Avengers to do as they please, and they form the Sokovia Accords to regulate the way the Avengers work. But Captain America doesn't like that, and becomes a fugitive. This fractures the Avengers in two, and leads to Captain America and Iron Man fighting. It evolves further when Bucky gets involved, and becomes a I thought we were besties issue. Iron Man wishes to get revenge on Bucky for killing Howard Stark, but Bucky is like, lol, nah, and Cap agrees with Bucky. In the end, Iron Man is beaten and Bucky is saved. But Cap gives Iron Man a consolation prize in the form of a cell phone with his telephone number on it. Immediately after this is the events of the Black Widow movie. Natasha Romanoff is located by Thunderbolt Ross and he chases her down. Meanwhile, another of the widows, Yelena Belova, who had been undercover with Natasha in America from 1993 to 1995, is freed from her mind control by another widow using a special chemical. She makes a run for it and sends the chemical to Natasha. Natasha gets it, but is immediately attacked by Taskmaster for it. She barely escapes with it, as well as the chemical. She tracks down Yelena, and the two fight for a while before calling a truce and talking it out. They are then attacked by other widows. The two flee. 
They end up breaking out Alexei Shostakov, aka the Red Guardian, the Soviet Union's answer to Captain America, from prison. They also track down Melina Vostokov, and together they decide to bring down the Red Room. However, Taskmaster appears to capture them. But Melina and Natasha switch places in an attempt to escape. Natasha confronts Drakov, while Melina frees the others and brings the Red Room out of the sky. Natasha stops smelling things by smashing her face and attacks Drakov, but it is revealed that Taskmaster is actually Drakov's daughter, who Natasha thought she killed years earlier with Drakov. Drakov escapes, but is killed when his helicopter explodes. Natasha and Taskmaster fight, but Natasha wins when she frees her from mind control. She then commissions the rest of the Widows to find their fellow spies and free them. Something I wish to say, though. While chronologically this movie comes before the Infinity War and Endgame, it was the latest movie of the bunch to feature actor William Hurt as Thunderbolt Ross. This movie was the last in the MCU to feature William Hurt as he sadly lost his battle to prostate cancer. Here's to you, William. We enjoyed your acting and your movies so much. Thanks for everything. Moving on to the Black Panther movies, T'Challa returns to Wakanda to take his place as the king, but is challenged. He wins the ritual combat and claims his place as the King of Wakanda. After this, Ulysses Klau attempts to steal a vibranium artifact from the Museum of Great Britain, but is stopped by T'Challa who hands the thief over to the CIA. This doesn't last long though, as Eric, a soldier who had taken the name Killmonger, kills Klau and delivers his body to Wakanda. He then challenges T'Challa to ritual combat and beats him. However, T'Challa is given another heart-shaped herb and gets his powers back. He then goes back to challenge Killmonger, who is now wearing the Black Panther armor, and defeats him. He offers mercy to Killmonger, but Killmonger decides he would rather die than be incarcerated, and allows himself to die a free man. T'Challa then announces that Wakanda will no longer hide from the world. This was also one of the last movies done by Chadwick Boseman before he lost his private battle with cancer. The last movie in the line that he did was in Avengers Endgame. It's so sad because so many people are always losing their lives to cancer. Here's to hoping they find a cure for it very soon. And while it is sad that Chadwick Boseman is gone, we will always remember him for bringing us so much joy with his films. Thanks, Chadwick. Wakanda forever. Next up is the Spider-Man movie. The movie starts out when Peter Parker gets bitten by a radioactive spider and Uncle Ben gets killed by Flint Marco. Oh wait, that's the wrong Spider-Man. Let's try again. The story starts when Peter Parker gets bitten by a spider when at Oscorp. He eventually needs to face the lizard who wants to turn the entirety of New York Wait, this is also the wrong Spider-Man. Let's try one more time. The story starts when Peter Parker doesn't get bitten by a radioactive spider because we've seen that and Uncle Ben's death so much that we get the point. Peter Parker appeared in Civil War, but I forgot to mention him, so oh well. But after this, he's still in contact with Tony Stark who continues to sponsor him as he had a hard time balancing school and superheroing. Meanwhile, damage control agent Adrian Toomes is taking Chitauri weapons from the Battle of New York and selling them on the black market. He's making a lot of money with this and is even pioneering new technology with it as well. Spider-Man gets on his tail, but eventually this causes Pete to encounter Toomes using his vulture gear. In the end, Pete risks his life to save Toomes, which earns his respect as Toomes ends up in prison. After this comes Doctor Strange. But before we begin, let's also mention that Smart Hulk comes back in time from the future at some point and convinces the Ancient One to let him borrow the Time Stone. Steve Rogers then returns to this time to return it. Dr. Stephen Strange is a world-class surgeon who has a perfect record of healing people with surgeries. Of course, this is generally because he turns away those he doubts he can heal. So to say he's egotistical is an understatement. He reminds me of Tony Stark in that way. However, he's showing off in his car, being reckless, and ends up crashing and when he does so, he damages his hands, severely damaging his nerve endings, which essentially guarantees the end of his career. Because of that, he begins to try everything he possibly can. When everything else fails, he goes into mysticism after a man who claims to have been paralyzed states that he can now walk after visiting a place called Kamar Taj in Nepal. So Strange goes to visit, but he ends up getting locked out when he insults the Ancient One. However, he begs long enough that they just feel so bad and let him in. They begin to teach him about the mystic arts, but he fails to read the warnings of the spells he casts, leading to him getting a scolding when he screws around with time through the use of the Eye of Agamotto. Eventually, he's led into battle against Caecilius and the others who have devoted themselves to Dormammu. In the end, they kill the Ancient One and Doctor Strange continues to guard the Sanctum, though it is later destroyed leading to the Dark Dimension's incursion into this dimension. 
This causes Dormammu to appear, but Doctor Strange manages to defeat him when he introduces the concept of time to Dormammu's dimension and uses it to create a temporal loop. This forces Dormammu to be either trapped in an endless causal loop or give in, so Dormammu gives in. Doctor Strange is then named the new Sorcerer Supreme. 2017 AD Thor has been trying to learn more about the Infinity Stones, but he has also been having dreams regarding Ragnarok, the event which marks the end of Asgard. To that end, he goes to Muspelheim to claim the crown of Suter. He manages to do so, but when he returns to Asgard, he realizes that Odin isn't acting like Odin and realizes that it is Loki in disguise. They go to see Odin on Earth in the old folks' home Loki left him in, only to find that home being torn down. Loki is then captured by Doctor Strange, and a card is delivered to Thor asking him to visit the Sanctum Sanctorum. Thor does so, and Loki is returned to him. Doctor Strange sends them to where Odin is located. Odin has a nice heart-to-heart -heart where he realizes that he was a sucky-ass father three ways to Sunday, and probably not the best king either. He then passes away by pulling a Master Yoda, and then Hela is free. Thor attempts to attack her, but his hammer is destroyed. In a panic, Loki calls for the Bifrost, but this allows Hela to reach Asgard. She forces Thor and Loki out, and they land on Sakaar. Thor ends up getting sent to the gladiatorial pits, and Loki manages to sweet-talk his way to the Grandmaster's side. Thor has his hair cut by Stan Lee, God rest that man's soul, and then ends up fighting the Hulk, where Thor technically wins, but Hulk officially wins due to Grandmaster's interference. Ah, <sighs> another day, another Doug. Thor wakes up in Hulk's chambers, where Hulk taunts him and makes fun of him, but to a point, they share experiences and identify with each other. Eventually, they are saved by Valkyrie. Thor tries to escape with the Quinjet that Hulk had with him, but Hulk ruins it when he doesn't want Thor to leave him. However, they accidentally activate a clip of Natasha telling Bruce to come back, and this causes Hulk to revert to a very terrified Bruce Banner who is trying not to re-Hulk out. They end up finding Loki, starting a revolt, hijacking one of Grandmaster's ships, and escaping through the Devil's Anus. They reach Asgard where Thor ends up going to the throne room, which calls Hela back. He confronts her, and the two fight. Eventually, Hela cuts out Thor's right eye. When Thor is on the ropes, he sees a vision of Hannibal Lecter, uh, Odin, who tells him he's not the god of hammers, and awakens Thor's potential, which allows him to channel lightning through his body to attack her. In the end, Thor puts Suter's crown onto the eternal flame, which awakens him and gives him the strength to destroy Asgard. Yes. Thor initiates Ragnarok just to kill his sister. And it works. Tough for them though, as they escape, their vessel is stopped by Thanos. 2018 AD Sometime before this happens, Clint Barton and Natasha Romanoff appear from the future and claim the Soul Stone when Natasha sacrifices herself for it. Captain America later comes to return it to the Red Skull, which I would have paid to see but was cheated out of it by the Russo brothers. While all of this is happening, the events of Ant-Man and the Wasp are occurring which sees Scott Lang and Hope Van Dyne attempting to find Janet Van Dyne, who is lost in the quantum realm. Along the way, they face off against the ghost, Ava Starr, a woman who is quantumly, is that even a word, unstable due to a failed experiment that killed both of her parents when she was little. They search for Janet and manage to find her, and once they bring her back, Janet gives some of her energy to Ava in hopes of curing her condition, which works. In the post credit scene, Scott Lang is in the quantum realm doing some experiments when suddenly the line goes dead. Showing what is going on in the real world, we witness that there is now nobody around the machinery. Ooh, mysterious. We move into Infinity War which picks up where Thor leaves off. Thanos has taken over the ship and seemingly killed everyone there except for Thor and Loki. He begins to torture Thor to get Loki to spill the beans on where the Tesseract is. Hulk suddenly attacks Thanos, but is saved when Heimdall opens the Bifrost to send Hulk to Earth. Loki then pledges loyalty to the Titan, only to then try and stab him, but Thanos grips his throat and snaps his neck. Thor is left to sob when the ship then explodes. Hulk crashes into the Sanctum Sanctorum. He then reveals to Doctor Strange and Tony Stark about Thanos, and how he was the hidden benefactor when Loki invaded New York with the Chitauri. They then suddenly get into a fight with the Black Order, who takes Doctor Strange and his Eye of Agamotto. Spider-Man and Iron Man end up on the Black Order's ship with Strange, and end up going where they were going. Thor is then picked up by the Guardians of the Galaxy. They prepare to fight Thanos by helping Thor create a Thanos killing weapon, which turns out to be Stormbreaker after they get that guy from Elf, Pixels, and Game of Thrones to make it for them. It's also partially made of Groot, so that's cool. The other half of the Guardians of the Galaxy decide to go to where the Collector is to get the Aether, which is the Reality Stone. They go there, but find that Thanos has already taken the stone. 
Gamora is then captured by Thanos and used as a sacrifice to get the Soul Stone. Back on Earth, the Black Order attacks Wanda and Vision, who are sort of a cute couple now, trying to steal Vision's Mind Stone. However, they are saved by Black Widow, Falcon, and Captain America. They retreat to the Avengers facility after defeating the Black Order. Back at the facility, the Avengers begin to contemplate a plan to deal with this. They realize that they may inevitably need to destroy the Mind Stone to stop Thanos, but they know they could possibly save Vision by having the stone removed with the technology available in Wakanda. Stark, Strange, and Parker manage to defeat Ebony Maw and take over the ship, but instead of returning to Earth, they continue on to Titan. Once they reach there, they are ambushed by the Guardians of the Galaxy. They eventually make friends, though, and attempt to work together to beat Thanos. And to their credit, they nearly do it through brains over brawn methods. But when Thanos provokes Peter, uh, the Quill one, not Parker, by telling him that he killed Gamora, Star-Lord, see I didn't make the mistake again, attacks Thanos, waking him from Doctor Strange's sleep spell. This causes Thanos to gain the upper hand and take the Time Stone from them, leaving the Guardians plus three on Titan alone as he goes to face off in Wakanda against the remaining Avengers. Back in Wakanda, the battle is set in array as Shuri quickly attempts to remove the stone from Vision's head. Sadly, this doesn't work, and Vision is forced into battle as well. Wanda, with tears in her eyes, musters the will to destroy the stone, killing Vision as well. However, Thanos uses the Time Stone to reverse time and take the stone manually, marking Vision as the only Avenger to die twice in the same movie. Poor Wanda, she gotta watch her man die not once, but two times. No wonder she goes coconuts and commandeers a whole town to LARP her dream life. Thanos takes the last Infinity Stone and proceeds to snap, becoming the ultimate thrifter by getting the entirety of civilization half off. Then the movie ends on a sad note. However, before the year ends, everyone continues to search for a way to fix what was wronged. Stark and Nebula return to Earth with the help of Carol Danvers. They eventually detect another snap on a distant planet and travel there to find Thanos undefended. They try to take the stones from him to undo the damage, but it is revealed that the stones were destroyed. Thor then kills Thanos for the hell of it. 2023 AD. Five years have passed since the snap. Everyone is trying to cope with the fact that everything sucks now. You know what doesn't suck? The fact that Tony Stark finally marries Pepper Potts and has a baby with her. That's awesome, but don't expect it to last long. Then suddenly a rat saves the universe by bringing Scott Lang back from the quantum realm. With his expertise, he helps them find a way to go back in time to find a way to stop Thanos. This is actually the time heist, and if you've been paying attention, you'll realize we've already covered this. They return to the future, except Black Widow, cause she dead and have Hulk snap everyone back into existence. It isn't long though until alternate past Thanos arrives and does his you've come back to me speech that is so memed out, and they all fight a massive battle. Thanos' forces are crippled by Captain Marvel who probably could have done all this by herself. Thanos attempts to use the stones to end existence so he can begin a new one that is grateful for what he did. Honestly, I don't see how any of this makes a difference. In like 20 years, the universe will be back to the same issue, that is, if we survive it. Many species would go extinct from the imbalance in the natural order. Either way, Thanos' plan was stupid and he was a terrible villain not to see that. Anyway, Tony says, I am Iron Man, snaps his finger, and makes me the saddest guy to watch the movie with an Iron Man t-shirt and previewing shaved Stark goatee. I was such a devastated fanboy. Probably cried a little. Don't you dare judge. We then see the funeral, and then after that, the heartbreaking Love You 3000 scene, and they send Cap back and he doesn't come back as they expect. My question is how he came back at all considering, I mean seriously, I thought the point was that timelines don't cross over, which is why they couldn't just kill baby Thanos, and yet Cap just ages back to the present after going back in time. I'm not a physicist, but I suppose the Russos and Kevin Foggy aren't either. I would love to know what kind of answer they have for this because while this scene has the warm and fuzzies, it basically makes the entire plot of the movie null and void if Cap really did just re-age back to the present. The events of WandaVision then take place. Wanda kinda loses her coconuts and so she proceeds to cast a hex around the town of Westview, altering reality to the point where everything and everyone is set up like an old sitcom moving up through the ages. Agatha also shows up here and reintroduces the Darkhold, which Wanda takes after defeating her and sentencing her to a life of sitcom. 2024 AD Falcon and the Winter Soldier The story centers around Sam Wilson and Bucky Barnes after Endgame. The US government has decided to pass the mantle of Captain America off to John Walker, who, along with the help of his sidekick, Battlestar, attempts to investigate the anti-nationalist group the Flag Smashers. Along the way, they discover that all of the Flag Smashers are enhanced with the Super Soldier Serum and learn that it is being reproduced. 
To help with this, Bucky and Sam spring Baron Zemo from the clink to get his help with the serum and learn more about it. They track down the scientist who made it, and Zemo kills him and begins to destroy the vials of serum. However, John Walker stops him from destroying the last vial and takes it himself. They continue to confront Thor's group until, in a rage, he kills one of the anti-nationalists. This causes John Walker to lose his rank and mantle as Captain America, and he is stripped of the shield by Bucky and Sam. They then head to the GRC to stop an attack and manage to do so with Sharon Carter's help. In the end though, it is discovered that the Flag Smashers were upset because the GRC were going to relocate people displaced by the blip. That is such a terrible name for the event. And so Sam decides to convince them through peaceful manners not to do so, and to instead aid them directly. After this is Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings. I already detailed a good bit of Shang-Chi's biography during the earlier section about the Mandarin, so I'll just continue on. Shang-Chi, or just Sean as his friends know him, is just a regular dude when all of a sudden a guy with a big razor blade for an arm tries to take his necklace. The guy succeeds, but Sean saves the people of the bus. Fearing for his sister, he heads to Macaw where he finds his sister, Xu Xia Ling, runs an underground fight club. Now funny enough, a scene here actually crosses over with She-Hulk, as we witness Blonsky in his abomination form facing off against Wong and we later learn in She-Hulk that this event is detrimental to Blonsky's parole hearing, but Wong clears it up later. They are then attacked by Ten Rings Ninja, because it wouldn't be an awesome kung fu action adventure without them. They end up surrounded though, and the Mandarin walks in and embraces his children, taking them back to their compound where he explains Tola to them. However, upon hearing that their father plans to raise the village if they don't resurrect Ying Li, his children turn against him and he is put in prison. There, they find Traver Slattery, who played the Mandarin in Iron Man 3, locked up for impersonating him. However, he wasn't executed because he is a funny guy, so Xu Shaoling insists that he is basically the Mandarin's court jester now. They manage to escape and beat their father to Tula where they learn of the Dweller in the Darkness beyond the gate. They prepare for war and war comes. Shang-Chi engages his father in battle but fails to stop him from breaching the gate. However, Xu Wenwu sacrifices himself to save Shang-Chi after realizing he was right and gifts him the Ten Rings. Shang-Chi takes it and with the Hilo of the Great Guardian Dragon, manages to kill the Dweller in the Darkness. Wong then recruits them to talk about what the Ten Rings are, and after that, they all go out to karaoke and sing Hotel California. Wong is becoming my favorite character. After this is the events of the Eternals. At this point, everything is A-OK, -okay. that is, until a sudden worldwide earthquake occurs. This causes some ice to melt in Alaska, revealing that some deviants still exist. Icarus reveals that he will not betray Arisham like Ajak wants to, and he allows her to be killed by the Deviants. He then heads to London to save Cersei and Sprite. They then head out to find Ajak, though Icarus knows he already killed her, and find her dead. They seek out Kingo, best character in the movie, as well as Gilgamesh, other best character in the movie, who feeds them spit beer and takes care of Thena who has gone bananas because she is so old. They go to find Druig, who has started a cult, and inform him not only of Ajax's death, but also that all Eternals are biological robots, and that Arisham destroys most sentient planets, and that Earth is seeded with the yet-to-be-born Celestial named Tiamut the Communicator. The Deviants attack the Eternals, and the one that killed and absorbed Ajax's powers, because I can't remember his name, I'm just going to call him Perfect Cell since it's the same concept, kills Gilgamesh and takes his powers too. Thena vows to kill him. The Eternals then recruit Fastos, who seems rather content not helping them, and they all travel to Babylon where their ship is waiting. They plan to make a big machine to create a Unimind that allows Druig to put Tiamut back to sleep. But Icarus and Sprite turn coat and reveal their allegiance remains with Arisham. They fight, but in the end, both are defeated and Tiamut is transmuted into stone, full metal alchemist style with his head half sticking out. The movie ends when Arisham appears before the Earth and takes the Eternals remaining on the planet, and says he will search their memories to decide if Earth is worth saving before passing his judgment. After this movie is Spider-Man Far From Home, in which Peter is just being Peter and all of a sudden, boom, multiversal collision. Or so it seems. He helps a guy named Mysterio fight against these elemental monsters, but it is revealed that he simply wanted to steal Stark tech and begins to use it to attack Peter. In the end, Mysterio is killed, but before he dies, he edits the footage of his death and leaks it to the Daily Bugle making Spider-Man a killer, and revealing Spider-Man to be Peter Parker. This movie immediately transitions into No Way Home in which Peter is trying to hide, but his cover is blown and he is on trial for murder. Matt Murdock decides to represent him and seemingly takes care of the legal side. But this doesn't change that everyone knows him now. And so, Pete goes to Doctor Strange for help, where he asks him to make everyone forget that he is Spider-Man. 
However, as Doctor Strange does this, Pete keeps making requests for people not to include, and completely messes up the spell, causing Doctor Strange to accidentally call everyone who knows a Peter Parker to come to their dimension. And that includes characters from Bully Maguire and Andrew Garfield's universes as well. They all team up to deal with characters, including but not limited to, Sandman, Green Goblin, The Lizard, and Electro. They all fight on the Statue of Liberty and make the shield fall off, which is okay with me, I thought it was stupid anyway. After defeating them, Doctor Strange manages to work on a new spell to make anyone who knows a Peter Parker forget who they are, and I guess that includes the other dimensions too. Sucks for Tobey Maguire's Peter because he was married to Mary Jane by this time. He's gonna go back home to his wife and she's gonna be like, mm, excuse me, who are you? Pete then goes to introduce himself to his friends, but like he chickens out and decides to walk away like Bill Bixby in the Incredible Hulk show. Someone please play Lonely Man for this boy. After this, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness takes place, in which Stephen Strange continues to deal with the effects of their multiversal tampering, which leads him to get help from Wong and Wanda Maximoff. This leads him to face off against the Illuminati and for Wanda to discover secrets about the Darkhold and herself that she previously had no idea about. During this time, they met America Chavez. Also, I need to ask you to forgive me, but this is the only Marvel movie I haven't seen yet, and I am super excited to stream it very soon, so please forgive me for not covering this one yet. Please and thank you. And yes, before you ask, I watch the movies out of order sometimes. Why do you think I needed to make this timeline? Hawkeye comes next. It's Christmas time, and a girl named Kate Bishop, who had been saved by Hawkeye during the Battle of New York, is at a gala with her mother and soon-to-be stepfather, Jack Duquesne. While there, she sees her old acquaintance, Armand, and approaches him with Jack. Armand reveals the sword and suit of Ronan, the name Hawkeye took during the blip when his family got snapped. It was actually badass, he became a ninja and everything, which sorta doesn't make sense, because a Ronin is a samurai without a master, not a ninja. But what does it matter, it's awesome. At that time, the tracksuit mafia, I know, weird name, bombs the gala and are fought off by Bishop and Jack. At this time, Clint Barton sees Ronan show up on the news, so as you know, he's curious. He tracks her down and reveals who she is, and together they begin a quest to take down the tracksuit mafia, as well as Jack Duquesne, who Bishop believes killed her acquaintance Armand. She convinces her mother to turn him into the police, which she does, and he claims he was framed, and he was. They eventually run into Yelena Belova, who wants revenge on Barton, thinking that he killed Natasha Romanoff, but she is defeated and sent packing. Belova was working with Maya Lopez, who wanted revenge on Ronan for killing her father, William Lopez. However, it's later revealed that Kingpin hired Ronan to kill William, and in the end, it all hits the fan. Belova learns that it was Eleanor Bishop who hired her and was working for Kingpin, who Jack had framed. Maya then shoots Kingpin. In the end, Clint returns to his home for Christmas with a shield Rolex for Laura and a golden retriever named Lucky. He brings Bishop with him and decides to help her name herself as a superhero. 2025 AD, Moon Knight. So, Poe Dameron got his brother drowned when they were wee babies and so Poe's mom hates him. He makes an alter ego for himself named Stephen Grant, which is sort of like multiple personality disorder. He normally has good control over it until suddenly he doesn't. He's at a dig site with his friend Raul Bushman and Abdullah al Fuli when Raul gets greedy and kills them all. Well, he tries to anyway. Poe makes his way into a tomb to kill himself when he hears the Egyptian moon god tell him to become a superhero. So he does. He also goes to Abdullah al Foley's daughter, Layla, and marries her out of guilt. After this, Poe's abusive mom dies and he feels sad. So sad, in fact, that Stephen Grant shows up to cause trouble. Poe wakes up and just goes home. Two months later, Grant wakes up in his apartment and heads to his job at the National Art Gallery where his boss sucks. He tries to stay awake, but he falls asleep and wakes up in Austria. He witnesses Arthur Harrow talking to his disciples about Amit and is judging them by its power. He then says that Poe stole the scarab of Amit, and Poe falls asleep, causing him to absolutely murder the disciples that attacked him. Later, back at the museum, Poe is confronted by Haro who demands the scarab, but Poe runs away. Haro sends jackals after him, but Poe hides in a restroom where Mark demands Grant give over his body, which he does, causing Mark to transform into the Moon Knight and kill the jackal. Grant is for sure that what happened was real, so he asks JB, the security guard, to show him the footage which shows Grant running from nothing and leaving without wearing the suit. However, he's still fired. He returns home only to find a key to a storage unit, which he goes to and opens up to find guns, passports, and the Scarab of Amit. Spectre tells Grant to give him control of the body, but Grant decides to take it all to the police. He then witnesses the Moon God and runs from it out of fear and is rescued by Spectre's wife, who Grant doesn't know. 
Harrow then asks Grant to give him the scarab, stating that Amit judges sins before they're committed and tells him not to trust Khonshu. Grant and Layla are attacked by jackals, and Grant jumps out of the window and transforms into a fancy variation of Moon Knight, but can't defeat the jackals, and so he gives it over to Spectre who does. However, the Moon God isn't happy because Harrow got the scarab, so he demands Spectre to hunt down Harrow or Khonshu threatens Layla's freedom. They travel to Egypt where they do a lot of killing. Spectre wakes up stabbing a guy in the heart and asks Grant if he did that, which he didn't. Khonshu is then called up by the other gods who dictate that Arthur Harrow isn't doing the things Khonshu is saying he is and eventually decide to turn Khonshu to stone. They manage to roll the night back to see what the stars looked like on the night that Senfu created the cartonnage that they found in Amit's sarcophagus. In the end though, Khonshu is stonified by Osiris, removing the Moon Knight powers from Spectre. They end up going to Amit's tomb, but Harrow's men are already there. Grant further finds a tomb which turns out to belong to Alexander the Great, and grabs Amit Sushabti, which is the key to Harrow's plan to bring back Amit. However, as Spectre talks to Layla and explains everything to her, Harrow flat out shoots Spectre and kills him. The next acid trip is them in a mental hospital, but is a buffer zone between their death and the afterlife. There, they find out that their hearts aren't balanced and they can't go to the Field of Reeds. Grant also learns that he is the alter ego and not Spectre. Grant then sacrifices himself for Spectre and Spectre's heart balances, allowing him to go to the Field of Reeds. However, he can't rest because Haro and Amit are killing a lot of people. Layla is then sent by Towerit to revive Khonshu, which she does, who works to bring Spectre back to life. Returning back, Spectre finds Statue Grant and hugs him, bringing him back to life, and the two are then revived by Khonshu. Haro, with Amit's help, kills the Enneads and then breaks Amit Sushapti, which fully releases her. Layla meets with the dying Ennead Selim, who tells her how to kill Amit. They must bind her to a human body and kill both bodies. Spectre and Grant then make a new deal with Khonshu and decide that if they fulfill this bargain, but binding Amit and Harrow, they can go free. Khonshu agrees. Layla is given powers by Taurat, who turns her into the Scarlet Scarab. Together they fight. Khonshu can't beat Amit, and Spectre can't beat Harrow. However, Spectre passes out and wakes up having won, knowing Grant didn't do it. They bind Amit to Harrow, but Spectre refuses to kill him, knowing he fulfilled his end of the bargain. Khonshu frees them from service. However, when Harrow is to leave the mental hospital, Khonshu introduces Harrow to his new friend, Jake Lockley, who is revealed to be a third persona of Grant and Spectre, who then kills Harrow. The events of She-Hulk then take place. The story revolves around Jennifer Walters, who accidentally gets some of Bruce Banner's blood into her body when they have a car crash involving a Sakaran spacecraft. She masters it quickly, though, and attempts to balance her life, only to find out most people are more interested in her She-Hulk persona except for her client Emil Blonsky and his self-help group. However, it is revealed that there are a group of haters out there who may or may not steal some of her blood depending on your interpretation of this comedy's strange canon, in which case, fourth wall breaks actually lead you into Marvel Studios to force a rewrite. She also starts a relationship with Daredevil. That, and it is revealed that Banner Hulk now has a son, Scar. So that's cool. Then we experience the Ms. Marvel storyline, Captain Marvel's superfan and Aisha's great-granddaughter, Kamala Khan meets with Bruno Corelli and Nakia Bahadir at school. Corelli and Kamala think of a plan to ask her strict parents if she could go to New Jersey Avenger Con. Khan is then called into her teacher's office. Her teacher tells her how she needs to start thinking about college. Kamala returns home and finds a package from her grandmother, Sana Ali. The package contains a bangle. Later at dinner, Kamala asks her parents about AvengerCon, but they immediately turn her down. Kamala talks in her room with her brother, Amir, who agrees to talk to her parents. After Amir talked with them, they decided they will let her go. They give Kamala the good news, but on the condition that she goes with her father, Yusuf, and wears a Hulk costume. This angers Kamala, which prompts her disappointed father to say she cannot go after all. That night, Kamala talks to Corelli about how she felt bad. However, she still thought of a plan to sneak out. Meanwhile, Corelli gets her Captain Marvel costume ready for the cosplay competition. He tells her that she needs a bit of herself in the costume to make it stand out. Kamala chooses the bangle. Kamala successfully sneaks out of her house and the two arrive at AvengerCon, Camp Lahai. Before the cosplay event, Kamala goes to the restroom to get dressed. However, she forgets her gloves that are made to look like Captain Marvel's photon blasts. She decides to put on her bangle instead. Upon wearing it, she sees a different world. She brushes this off and gets on stage. During her presentation, she gets blinded by the camera flashes, which sets off a blast of hard light energy from the bangle. The energy hits a giant Mjolnir prop, 
which sends it flying into Kamala's classmate, Zoe Zimmer. Kamala reaches out and the bangle generates a hard light fist that catches Zimmer. After the commotion, Kamala returns home to see her mother waiting for her. Muniba gives Kamala a talk before leaving. Kamala then sits back in her bed, marveling at her new power. Meanwhile, the United States Department of Damage Control sees the event at AvengerCon. Agent Cleary and Sadie Deaver take on the case. The following day, Zimmer has gained a new following after uploading videos of the new hero. She coins the hero's name as Nightlight, but nobody knows that it was Kamala. After school, Corelli and Kamala test out her powers and train. Kamala is able to walk on her hard light structures. Corelli tests her DNA and finds out that it is different than human DNA. Later that night, Kamala and Corelli go to Zimmer's party that she is holding after her near-death experience. They meet a new student, Cameron, whom Kamala immediately clicks with. They go out on a date the following day. At dinner, Kamala listens to Yusuf tell the story of how Ali followed the stars back to her father. Kamala then has a vision of a woman pointing at her. Meanwhile, Zimmer is brought into the DODC and interrogated by Cleary. Zimmer reveals that Nightlight was Middle Eastern. Cleary sends agents to look at every mosque. During Eid Mubarak, a kid is taking selfies on a window ledge when he falls out of it, hanging by a curtain. Kamala quickly puts on her Captain Marvel costume and walks on her hard light until she is under the boy to catch him. She instructs the boy, Hamid, to step on the structure with her. As they walk to the edge, Kamala gets another vision causing her to lose focus. Hamid falls but she catches him right before he hits the ground. Kamala then worriedly runs into the alley where she is attacked by Stark Industries combat drones. She runs away from them but a car shows up. Cameron tells her to get in. She thanks him but is confused. He introduces Kamala to his mother, Najma. They bring Kamala to safety and explain to her that they are part of the clandestines, a group that included a few others and her great-grandmother. Najma also explains that Kamala is not human, but of the same species as them. The clandestines have been trying to get back to their homeworld, the Noor dimension. When Kamala returns home, Muniba tells her that Corelli left her a gift. Kamala opens it and finds an eye mask. Meanwhile, Corelli does more research, and finds out that traveling back to the Noor dimension could be dangerous. However, Khan tells Cameron that she will help them despite the cautions. Later, Kamala attends her brother's wedding and has a lot of fun. Suddenly, Najma and the clandestines arrive saying they've waited long enough. Cameron tries to warn Kamala, but he's too late. Kamala is chased into the kitchen where she pulls the fire alarm so that people leave. She then blocks their attacks. Salim goes to punch Kamala, but Corelli gets in their way, injuring himself. Cameron gets Kamala and Corelli out, but is thrown off of a balcony. As the two get cornered, Najma touches the bangle, which leads them both to see a vision of a Karachi train coming at them. The DODC arrives and arrests the clandestines, including Cameron, but Corelli and Kamala escape with the help of Bahadir, who feels betrayed that Kamala didn't tell her about her powers. Kamala returns home and calls her grandmother regarding the bangle. Ali told her that she saw the train too and Kamala needs to come to Karachi right away. Kamala and Muniba then hop on a plane after Kamala insists that they go. Upon arriving, she finally sees her grandmother after many years and also meets her cousins. After talking for a bit, Kamala goes out into the city where she finds a vigilante who attacks her. The two engage in a fight until the man notices the bangle and asks if she is clandestine. He then brings her to his residence to ask more questions. He introduces himself as Kareem, the Red Dagger, which is a title passed down through many warriors including his mentor Walid. Walid explains to Kamala the Noor dimension and its dangers, as well as teaching Kamala how to control her power. Meanwhile, the clandestines escape Damage Control's custody, but Najma leaves Cameron, who she thinks betrayed her. Ali and her daughter, Muniba, talk. After a conversation, Muniba is able to make up with her mother and in turn makes up with Kamala and understands her more. The next day, Walid, Kareem, and Kamala are attacked by the clandestines. Walid throws a dagger at Salim, killing him. In retaliation, Najma kills Walid. The two heroes run until they are cornered. Red Dagger kills Adam during a short battle. Najma tries to stab Kamala, but hits the bangle which sets off an energy burst that transports Kamala to 1947. She looks around and finds Aisha, who she sees get stabbed by Najma. Kamala tries to help Aisha, but sees it's too late. Aisha gives Kamala a picture of her family. She then sees a young and lost Ali. Kamala then sets off a trail of hard light to lead her back to her father. Kamala stands in awe and she realizes that she was the person who saved Ali. She then travels back to the present and sees that Najma has opened up the rift to the Noor dimension. Faria touches the rift, but gets disintegrated into a skeleton. Seeing how dangerous it is, Najma realizes that she could close it, but at a cost. 
She calls out to Cameron before touching the rift, which kills her but closes it. In America, Cameron hears Najma's whisper which sets off a power inside of him. He stands there and creates a hard light fist. Ali and Muniba find Kamala and realize that she is a hero. Kamala gives Ali the picture. Before departing, Red Dagger gives Kamala his red cloth. Cameron visits Corelli for help. Suddenly, a DODC drone shoots at Cameron. He throws hard light energy at it before it explodes the building. Corelli and Cameron escape, but Cameron cannot contain the energy surging within him. Kamala returns home and hears that Circle Q exploded. She asks Corelli, but to no response. Muniba gives Kamala a suit that she made. The two fugitives go to a mosque, where Sheikh Abdullah gives them clothes to blend in before sending them on their way. They meet with Kamala at the school. Bahadir, Amir, and Zimmer arrive as well to help. As DODC agents move in, the group sets off non-lethal attacks and traps. Cleary calls Deaver and tells her to take their men out because it is bad for publicity, but Deaver doesn't listen and calls for more troops. The group gets themselves captured in order for Kamala and Cameron to escape. Cameron goes outside where he is shot at by agents. Kamala runs in and blocks the attacks. She sees him and says, Embiggen, which allows her powers to form hard light around her arms and legs, making them seem stretchy and big. Cameron cannot hold his power much longer and sets off a big wave of energy. Kamala puts them into a hard light sphere to protect everyone. She then tells him what happened to his mother, which calls Cameron down. Kamala then tells him to get to the harbor while she buys time. Deaver gets a call from an angry Cleary, who orders her to remove her agents and fires her. In the following days, Kamala has a talk with Yusuf, who tells her that Kamal means Marvel. Kamala is in shock to hear that her name is like Carol Danvers. Yusuf tells her that she always was his little Ms. Marvel. Meanwhile, Cameron arrives in Pakistan and meets Kareem. A week later, Corelli tells Kamala that he ran tests on her DNA again and found that she has mutations. Kamala returns home but suddenly feels a wave of power. She is then sent flying through her door, seemingly teleporting. Carol Danvers then comes out of her closet, having switched places with Kamala. She looks around before leaving the house confused. Next is Thor, Love and Thunder. Gore, the last of his people, spends his days striving to survive on a barren desert with his daughter. He prays to his god Rapu for help, but his daughter soon dies of starvation. Just as he begins to hear a voice calling out to him in the distance, Gore discovers an oasis where he finds Rapu, who had killed the latest wielder of an ancient weapon known as All Black the Necrosword. Rapu makes fun of Gore for his helplessness and refuses to provide any assistance. Feeling betrayed, Gore claims the Necrosword and beheads him, and vows for the elimination of all gods. Thor continues his adventures with the Guardians of the Galaxy, responding to distress calls across the universe while working to get back in shape. However, Thor remains discontent with where he is in life and intends to retire. An influx of distress calls regarding Gore emerge, one of them being from Sif, who had hunted him down. Thor and Korg respond to Sif's call, parting ways with the Guardians who leave to respond to the others. They find a defeated Sif with her arm severed, who warns them that Gore will attack New Asgard next. Meanwhile, Dr. Jane Foster undergoes treatment for stage 4 cancer. Efforts to research for a cure prove futile and she begins to lose hope, but Foster becomes inspired to travel to New Asgard in hopes that their magic can help eliminate the cancer. As Thor has unknowingly enchanted it to protect Foster while they were together, Mjolnir becomes drawn to her presence, fusing itself back together and imbuing her with the powers of the mighty Thor. That night, Gore uses the Necrosword to swarm New Asgard with shadow monsters. Thor, Korg, and Sif arrive to confront them, as does King Valkyrie and Foster, who Thor is surprised to see. While they were able to repel the monsters, Gore escapes with Asgard's children, including Heimdall's son Axel. Thor communicates with Axel and deduces that the children are in the Shadow Realm. Knowing that Gore's strength would be at its peak there, Thor, Mighty Thor, Valkyrie, and Korg travel to Omnipotent City to warn Zeus of Gore and ask for an army to help fight him. Unconvinced that Gore is a threat to Omnipotent City, Zeus instead has Thor captured, forcing the others to intervene and fend off Zeus's men. In the scuffle, Zeus uses his thunderbolt to destroy Korg's body. Only his face remains intact, although this is enough for him to survive. Enraged, Thor uses the thunderbolt to impale Zeus in the chest which Valkyrie steals as the group escapes to confront Gore in the Shadow Realm. On the way, Thor learns of Foster's cancer diagnosis and the two rekindle their relationship. Upon arrival, they attempt to locate the children, only to realize that they had fallen for a trap. Gore intended to take Stormbreaker in order to utilize the Bifrost Bridge to access Eternity, where he can wish for the extinction of the gods. 
They battle Gore and his shadow monsters once more, but are forced to flee back to New Asgard once Valkyrie and the mighty Thor are weakened. Before Stormbreaker can be transported across a Bifrost, Gore steals it. Thor is informed that the effects of Mjolnir are aggravating Foster's cancer, and he urges her to stay behind to recover. Valkyrie is also unable to continue fighting, leaving the Thunderbolt in Thor's possession so that he can fight Gore again. At the center of the universe, Gore begins opening Eternity's Gate with Stormbreaker. Thor arrives using Thunderbolt and imbues the children with the power of Thor, giving them enough strength to overcome the remaining shadow monsters. Gore gains the upper hand against Thor. Having sensed his distress, Foster decides to wield Mjolnir again, despite her weakened condition, and joins the fight using Valkyrie's winged horse. Thor gives Mighty Thor ample time to use Mjolnir to shatter the Necrosword into pieces, dooming herself and Gore. Thor recovers Stormbreaker and has the children use it to return home, but they could not stop Gore from entering eternity. Thor calls out to Gore and pleads for him to choose love over death as he rushes to Mighty Thor's side. Their love reminded him of the love he had for his daughter, thus deciding to use his wish to resurrect her. Foster soon succumbs to the cancer, vanishing into Valhalla. Thor accepts Gore's request to take custody of his daughter before he dies from the Necrosword's curse. In the aftermath, a statue of Foster as the mighty Thor was erected in New Asgard. Sif and Valkyrie begin training the children in combat, while Korg's body fully regenerates as he seeks to produce an offspring. Thor starts to raise Gore's daughter as his own, entrusting her with Stormbreaker while he wields Mjolnir into battle. The two begin traveling the galaxy, offering assistance to whomever needs it, becoming known as Love and Thunder. In the meanwhile, Zeus begins to recover from his injuries as he sends out his son Hercules to kill Thor. Foster encounters Heimdall in the afterlife, who welcomes her to Valhalla. Whoa, doggy, that was a massive timeline. And we couldn't have done it without the Marvel Cinematic Universe fandom. When I was fuzzy on a few details, they were sure to jog my memory. I hope you all enjoyed it. I sure did. It was a monster to put together, but what else can I say? I love the MCU, and it's a large series to recap. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, give a like. And if you haven't subscribed, be sure to do that. Be sure to ring the bell when more content like this drops.